welcome everyone to the Hoover History Lab discussion of sanctions and Russia, effects, lessons, and the future. I am Stephen Kotkin, director of the Hoover History Lab. With me today are Mikhail Bernstam, also of the Hoover Institution at Stanford, and Sergei Guriev of the Institut d'Etudes Politiques de Paris, otherwise known as Sciences Po. This week, the Russian Central Bank raised interest rates 3.5%, a very significant jump. Russia is experiencing inflation, budget deficit, capital flight, human capital flight, and labor shortages. Today, we're aiming for a data-rich, unsentimental analysis of the sanctions on Russia, their effects, and where they might be heading and whether Russia is vulnerable or not, in fact, genuinely, in its economy. We want a sober understanding rooted in logic and the facts and how the situation actually is, not how we want it to be. Cut through the noise to the fundamentals. And we have two of the great experts alive, fortunately, to lead us in this discussion. So let me pose the first question to Sergei Guriev. Um, how can we describe the sanctions on Russia? What does the term sanctions actually include and not include? And, and are there categories of the sanctions or groupings of the sanctions? And how do the sanctions compare to others in the past? Give us a sense of what these specific sanctions have been. Thank you very much, Stephen, for inviting me to the podcast. Indeed, uh, this is a very special uh, episode in the history of sanctions. Uh, in the last couple of years, Russia has had more sanctions than any other country in the history of geoeconomics, in history of economic warfare, if you like to call it this way. Sanctions are defined as government-imposed economic restrictions, and I think definitions are important here because some of the economic restrictions in the last year and in this year were actually imposed by companies rather than governments. A lot of action is going on because of reputational concerns. Uh, private uh, actors actually decide not to maintain any links with Russia, exit Russia to some extent. And in that sense, when we talk about sanctions, we should not confuse the actions imposed by the governments, the undertaken by the governments, and the actions taken by private sector. But uh, anyway, when you ask this question about uh, kinds of sanctions, I think it's not just the uh, quantity of sanctions, also different categories of sanctions, which become uh, very, um, very extensive. So Russia has faced macroeconomic sanctions imposed by the Western governments, by a coalition, which includes previously neutral countries such as Switzerland, non-Western countries such as Singapore, but also, of course, EU, G7, um, all members of the Western coalitions, these sanctions were introduced on the third day of the war, sanctions against Russian Central Bank and Central Bank Reserves. That was a very, very important uh, step, a very quick step, which eventually, in the course of several uh, days and weeks, triggered a major macroeconomic panic. This panic was controlled uh, later on, but still it was something unprecedented. Another type of sanctions, was the trade sanctions, sanctions against exporting to Russia sensitive technologies, sensitive components. Russia by now has learned how to circumvent at least some of those sanctions. And we see how using uh, its uh, intermediaries in third countries, Russia succeeds circumventing some of those sanctions. Uh, but still, these sanctions were also unprecedented in their scale and magnitude. Uh, the other, uh, the other uh, kind of sanctions, which I already mentioned, were not sanctions, but actions by the private sectors who exited Russia, which undermined Russia's capacity to produce various goods. Uh, most importantly, in 2022, Russian automotive sector uh, suffered because Russian automotive production was very much uh, um, relying on Western, uh, Western partners, uh, as well as Japanese and Korean partners which also imposed uh, those uh, government or private sector sanctions on Russia. Uh, in addition, um, and that is probably the most consequential of all sanctions, Russian uh, government saw uh, oil export sanctions. So initially in the spring of 2022, UK and US imposed oil embargo on Russia, but most importantly, 
uh, because uh, Russian oil was mostly sold to Europe rather than US and UK. Um, Europe imposed an embargo on Russian oil and uh, uh, oil products in December 2022 and February 2023, adding, which is again something unprecedented, oil price cap. So US and Europe said if Russia exports oil, it has to sell it uh, at a price no higher than $60 per barrel. Now, again, recently we saw that even those uh, types of sanctions can be circumvented at least partially, but uh, in the first half of 2023, these sanctions really had a catastrophic impact on Russian export revenues, Russian oil and gas uh, export revenues and oil and gas taxes. Uh, and in addition, of course, there are also thousands of Russian individuals and companies who were sanctioned, not just Russian economy as a whole, but individual uh, sanctions. And again, we talk about thousands of individuals and thousands of companies, entities uh, sanctioned by US, uh, Europe, Canada, Australia, and other members of the sanctioning coalition. So it sounds very impressive. It sounds even more impressive, given that private companies not compelled to act have also acted as you suggested. Um, you described it as epoch making. That is to say, this episode is more significant than previous ones in terms of geoeconomics. Let's turn to Mikhail Bernstam now to talk about the effects of the sanctions. We see what, how large the effort has been uh, in many different categories, from banking through trade, uh, th through other aspects, but what are the effects and have the, the actual effects of the sanctions? Which of the effects have been predictable? Which of the effects have been surprising? How do we actually measure the effects? Uh, are we uh, looking at effects that we'd like to see and perceiving them, or are those effects in reality? Do we have short-term effects versus medium-term and long-term effects? Uh, Mikhail, help us a little bit understand the effects of these sanctions. Well, a quick answer is all of the above uh, for what you said. Uh, first of all, how do you measure it? Uh, and the, the measurement, the timing is very important. The most uh, widely quoted data is that the Russian GDP uh, declined by 2.1% in 2022. But there were two good months, January and February. The war started effectively in the end of February. So if you measure it from March, from March 1, 2022 to March 1, 2023, it is 3.1%. So you can play with the data the same way we do with the Great Recession in the United States, because when you ask people about the Great Recession, they say it is all right, it is 2.6% contraction in 2029, but if you measure the entire period, it is 4.3% from the end of 2027, uh, uh, to, uh, excuse me, for, from the end of 2007 through 2009. So in Russia, you can add that in the first uh, half of 2023, this year, uh, we have the preliminary data that uh, there is a recovery actually. And the first quarter saw the decline of 1.8% of GDP. The second quarter uh, increased preliminary 4.9. So uh, arithmetically, it is one plus 1.5% 1 for the first half of 2023. It may be revised later. The world two things uh, which uh, Sergei alluded to. There were twice Russia was on the brink. One was February the 28th, 2022, when there was effectively bank failures and uh, uh, there was a panic run on banks and the central bank cleverly injected seven trillion, trillion with a T, dollars uh, into the banking system. And the other one, was similar, it was what, three days ago on the 15th of August, 2023, another seven a trillion. And today there is a data which shows that only half of tri uh, half trillion rubles of this was in rubles, the rest was in dollars. So there was a uh, fear that the banking system may become liquid and there was a huge liquidity injection. So of these episodes, you can show, you can see that the risks are very, very high 
for the economy, and especially I would emphasize in the banking sector. And the next risk, the huge risk, is in the debt sector. You remember the debt crisis in Europe in 2010 after the Great Recession. And this is because of the price cap and the sanctions and the oil export, which Sergei mentioned correctly. And because of that, the current account surplus has declined uh, in the seven months of 2023 to $25 billion. And uh, it, for a comparison, in the first seven months of 2022, it was 165 billion. So it's an 85% decline. And uh, the data on the debt, which they have to pay in the next 12 months, is about, it's over $100 billion. They have to repay it. And because of the EU sanctions of June 2022, there is no refinancing. So how they even ha handle it? Now there is some mysterious uh, data which I don't fully understand. There is an additional borrowing of about uh, uh, ten billion dollars probably from China. So maybe maybe the Chinese are bailing them out. But generally the arithmetic is very simple. You need to repay the debt. There is no refinancing except maybe from some from China, and the current account surplus doesn't allow it. So. On the 9th of August 2023, there was a document issued, which what I think is very important, correct me if I'm wrong, no one paid attention to it. The president of Russia issued the presidential decree in which it was effectively a default, in which he said that all state guarantees on the private debt of Russian corporations and Russian banks are now can be paid in rubles. They can no longer be paid in dollars and euros. This is technically it's a default. It didn't happen yet, but there is already what in the Middle Ages was called indulgence. Mm. Mm. Okay, Mikhail, that's a very uh, sobering picture of the macroeconomic effects that we see and Russia's attempt to manage its current accounts, its foreign reserves, its debt repayments, and just in general, the overall health of the banking system. Let's talk a little bit about the effects in the broader economy as well. Uh, for example, Sergey has already mentioned the uh, private automobile sector and the, the big effects that we've seen there. Of course, we wanna understand the effects on the military industrial complex, if any, the ability to continue to produce uh, weapons at scale, uh, for the war effort, but also any changes uh, that are significant in the makeup of Russia's domestic product. For example, are certain sectors growing while other sectors are shrinking? And what are the implications of that? And is that attributable to sanctions or are there other, uh, for example, tendencies, trajectories that predate the war, predate the sanctions that have been accelerated or reversed? And how might we understand Russia's place in the global economy, in addition, as effects of the sanctions? So let's take, Sergei, let's go to you and talk about the uh, both the domestic effects beyond the macroeconomic stability, as well as maybe Russia's global position economically. And then we'll come back to Mikhail for the same question. Yes, Stephen, this is a very good question because uh, we started with the GDP numbers and Mikhail is correct uh, that this is the top line figure that everybody's interested in. But as you mentioned, the impact is highly unequal on different parts of Russian economy. And uh, one of the things which non-economists usually miss, you as an uh, economic historian know that very well, is that GDP during the war is a different indicator than GDP during peacetime. When a defense industry produces tanks and munitions, and as you told me, and as you are you're going to write in your book, uh, average tank survives for four days in the battlefield, and every average munition probably a few days, uh, maybe a couple of days. So basically, it's just destruction of value. But for an economic statistician, that adds one for one to GDP. So if there is one billion dollar uh, worth of munitions, then it's one billion dollars uh, worth of GDP. So the fact that Russian GDP has not collapsed as much as people thought in the beginning is also because Russian defense spending 
has gone up so much. And various estimates suggest that instead of spending three and a half or four percent of GDP on uh, military and defense uh, purposes, Russian budget spends something like seven percent of GDP, maybe eight percent of GDP. We don't know for sure. These data are classified, classified beyond the normal uh, Russian government uh, reporting practices. Last year, we've seen a lot of data being removed from a public debate. So it's very hard to conduct a quantitative analysis right now. But the ver various estimates suggest that Russian defense sector is doing extremely well, at least in the, in the, in the sense of those top line numbers. I mentioned uh, automotive, automotive sector. Automotive sector collapsed by 60% year on year in 2022. This is a huge, huge difference. Now it will try to rebuild itself using Chinese partners. Uh, that, would, that could help, of course. Uh, there are various impacts, of course, on retail trade, on construction, especially housing construction. So uh, in a sense, you have a defense economy, which is not half of Russian economy. It's much smaller. It's not a war like World War II in that sense. Not for uh, Russia. It's not comparable to Soviet Union's war economy or even the United States a war economy in 1940s. Uh, yet it's a big, big uh, difference between defense industry and uh, household consumption industry. And here, for example, if you look at numbers like household consumption, uh, retail trade turnover, how much Russian households spend on goods, this number is much more catastrophic than uh, GDP numbers. So if you look at the decline in retail trade turnover, how much Russian households spend in shops, this number has declined in 2022 by 8 or 10%, depends on which months you're looking at. So it's a much bigger impact. So there is, there is a, different, a differential impact. Your question on the role of Russia in global economy, of course, the biggest Russian trade partner was EU. Now, Russia no longer sells oil and gas to the EU. The embargo is not complete. There are still some buyers of Russian gas. There is still some transit through Euro Ukrainian territory to Europe. And Russia keeps paying Ukraine for transit of Russian gas. But the share of gas imports in European energy balance, uh, the share of Russian gas imports has collapsed from something like 40 to 50% to something like 5%. So in that sense, the trade has gone down. And now the biggest Russian trade, trading partner is China. And one of the biggest buyers of Russian oil in now, is now India. And biggest suppliers of military equipment, and this is something that we don't know for sure, but anecdotal evidence suggests that Russia now buys a lot of military equipment and even munition from North Korea and Iran. This is a huge reorientation of Russian, of Russian economy. But again, as I mentioned, many types of data are now classified, and in particular, foreign trade data are now no longer public. Luckily, we have leaks, Russian uh, state is not totalitarian, it's very corrupt, it's very leaky, and so we have researchers who look at leaked data, leaked uh, customs data, and show who buys and who sells to Russia. Thank you. Uh, Mikhail, same questions about the uh, effects on Russia's overall domestic economy uh, beyond the macroeconomic picture you presented, and as well Russia's position in the world economy. Uh, the big question is why uh, economic uh, contraction was much slow, uh, much smaller than we expected. And uh, among other things, I would mention three things. One is geology, that Russia is a net, major net exporter of energy and now of grain. So whatever sanctions you impose, Russia cannot starve and Russia cannot darken, no matter what you do. So don't expect a knockout. Don't expect that a blitz, blitzkrieg would work. That's real. The second thing is it's paradoxical it is the COVID because uh, the sanctions coincided with the global recovery from the COVID. If you look at oil prices, they were $20 per barrel in April 2020. And before the war, they were already $80 per barrel. Lots of people attribute the rise of the oil price, uh, prices to the war. Uh, I strongly doubt it because at the peak, they were $100 per barrel in June 2022. So it might have been a small contribution. And now they are down to 83 or 84. So the war 
did not much contribute and the global markets uh, reshuffled and rerouted their oil supplies and the design of the oil sanctions was not to reduce the global supply, to reduce the budgetary and uh, general revenues and the budgetary revenues, but not the global oil supply. And the third factor, which we always talk about and never appreciated to the extent it deserves globalization, that the world and the sanctions captured the world in the middle or in the expansion of globalization. And these are the tectonic shifts. If you look at the map of Russian trade and global trade before the war and now, it's totally changed. First of all, we have the phenomenon which I call the external import substitution. When all the four former Soviet countries suddenly found a niche, they all speak Russian, they all have personal relations with Russian traders, and suddenly there is a huge opportunity for them to repurchase or purchase the imports that are banned from Western countries and sell them to Russia. There is an arbitrage commission there, they own, but if you look at the imports, you will see that in real terms, imports declined by 15%, in 2022, but in nominal terms only by 9%, which means the Russians are buying. And now, now they're up. Now actually they're up almost 20% in nominal terms, which means that in real terms they're probably recovered from, from before the war, which means that they're buying the same things, maybe of lower quality, from maybe the same Western producers. We are the third countries, and those countries are former Soviet republics, Turkey, China, India, Middle Eastern countries, anything. And uh, then there is this external, the second part of the external import substitution is that uh, uh, some countries like uh, Iran and Turkey and China, they are producing these goods, uh, they're lower quality, the Russians are buying them. So if we expected, like I did, and it was my mistake, that the total supply chain's disruption on the scale of COVID, lines, queues, whatnot, didn't happen. Didn't happen thanks to globalization, thanks to Prime Minister Khrushchev who started the oil production in Russia in the early 60s, thanks to the uh, recovery from the COVID with the recovering uh, demand of oil of 100 uh, million barrels per day. So this is, this is the picture in which globalization played a huge role. And now it is the rerouting, total rerouting, total change of the supplies of oil from EU. Now it goes to China and India mostly, some to Bangladesh, some to Pakistan, some to other countries. And generally now everyone, everyone is buying Russian oil at discount and selling it at market prices. And more than half of those are the affiliates of Russian oil companies who are cheating their government. The crooks are on our side. They are cheating the Russian government from tax revenues on oil by low sell high you know i have to say that i am not it's not everyone michael because i am not buying russian oil at discount and reselling it i'm behind the curve here unfortunately but here we're already thank you for that i i didn't understand this concept external import substitution and in fact i'm hearing it for the first time and it's it's a, a revelation for me Let's talk, uh, dive more deeply into the responses question. Uh, Sergei, we're going to talk about the responses of the Russian government, of the central bank, of the finance ministry, of other ministries. Uh, these are run by people you know, uh, people that you um, worked with over time before being forced out of Russia uh, to Paris. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the hemorrhaging of human capital that Russia is experiencing and labor shortages. We have two prime examples here on this uh, podcast of the hemorrhaging of human capital, uh, two top economists that they've lost. Talk about whether Russia's responses, government official responses, have been predictable or surprising. Whether it's in fact the government that's the main actor here or it's the responses of the population more broadly. As well, please address uh, Mikhail's point about how the responses are well beyond Russia and that those may even be the most important responses. The responses, for example, of governments 
in the now independent formerly Soviet republics that surround Russia, as well as other countries that border Russia like Turkey or, or that are close by Iran, uh, the Emirates, et cetera. So how do we understand the response question, the quality of the response and, and whose responses have been more important than others? Uh, thank you, Stephen. I fully agree with Mikhail that uh, Russia faced a major challenge on the third day of the war when Russian Central Bank was sanctioned. And at that point, it was very uh, likely that Russia would face a major bank run. And uh, what Russian government or Russian Central Bank has done, they uh, played a very unusual strategy where they injected liquidity, but on in addition to that, they closed down markets and they also limited withdrawals from your um, deposit accounts. And that is something which actually uh, I didn't expect. I thought if you tell Russian population, sorry, you cannot withdraw your currency deposits, Russian public would take to the street. But that didn't happen. And this is where we should not forget that the response by macroeconomic team was actually accompanied by the response by internal repression team, right? In the very first days of the war, Russian public understood very clearly that before this 2022 war started, you could uh, demonstrate, you could protest, especially on non-political but economic issues. After 24th of February, 2022, you show up in the street, you get beaten up, tortured, you go to jail for many years. So when we talk about macroeconomic policy response, we should not forget that it was also a, a major intensification of repression that also had Russian central bank policy. So it's not just central bank, but also uh, National Guard, Rosgvardia, the riot police, which contributed to making it feasible to pretty much freeze Russian, Russian households financial assets. But so that was a very, a very effective response. The public, uh, uh, the public understood it cannot actually run on the banks. The financial panic uh, was uh, uh, limited. Uh, and uh, then in 2022, with something which uh, we saw something which surprised a lot of people, uh, ruble became much stronger. Why? Because uh, exports continues. Um, export continued until December 2022. We mentioned that oil sanctions on the European side were introduced effectively only in December. And so Russia had a record year with the record current account surplus that Mikhail mentioned in 2022. So Russia continued to sell a lot of oil at high prices with a discount, but still at high prices. Again, uh, the post-COVID global uh, recovery helped. But again, Russian imports collapsed because of sanctions imposed on trade and exodus of foreign companies, exodus of Western companies from Russia. So Russia had this uh, strange equilibrium where it uh, received a lot of dollars, but it couldn't spend it on imports because of Western sanctions and exodus of uh, Western corporations. And that of course contributed to stronger ruble. Now these factors are mitigated and uh, now the challenge is the opposite one. Russian ruble is now twice as weak as a year ago. It used to be uh, two American cents. Now it's one American cent. And so Russian central bank and public is worried about this and is trying to think about the issues that Mikhail just mentioned about the cost of debt servicing and so on. But uh, in 2022, Russian government would wear this as a badge of honor saying, look, ruble is strong, so your sanctions don't work. Well, in, in effect, it was just an indication that oil sanctions are not there yet, but they're coming. Trade sanctions are uh, functioning very well, and then uh, your imports are constrained, which is bad for you, for example, for your automotive sector. In 2023, the situation is actually very different. As Mikhail mentioned, we export much less oil, or at least we get much less oil do petrodollars, but we learn how to circumvent trade sanctions through Turkey, Central Asian countries, some other intermediaries, and uh, this is where the factors are working in the opposite direction. And so Russian government has done a great job in using those third countries, as Mikhail mentioned, as you mentioned, to circumvent technological sanctions, uh, trade sanctions. And this is now the main challenge for the sanctioning coalition, which of course US and Europe understand very well, but it's very hard to implement. But the challenge is to enforce sanctions that are in place. 
because uh, the circumvention is, is really, really helping Russian war machine. Uh, the US and Europe are trying to do that. It's not easy. I, I won't say that, say, Kazakhstan's government or Armenian government want to help Russia circumvent the sanctions, but it's very hard to play this uh, whack a mole game because these are the private actors in those countries. Sometimes these are actors owned by the Russian companies themselves, which help to circumvent those sanctions. And I think the only way here is to impose secondary sanctions on those players uh, who help Russia, which is, of course, very hard because you need to prove that these uh, sanctions uh, are being circumvented. In the US, the approach is very simple. You impose sanctions the day after, as you wish. In Europe, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, there is a great respect for rule of law. So European Union says, unless we can defend our decision in court, we won't go ahead with sanctioning this or that player. So this is a very, very difficult game. And this is one of the major challenges today for the West, if the West wants to undermine Russian war machine. And the other challenge, of course, is to reduce oil price cap from 60 to say 55 or 50, further uh, limiting resources that Russian government has. Mikhail, help us out also on this question of uh, whether the response has been effective or ineffective uh, by Russian officials, whether they just got lucky or they know what they're doing. And also talk us through a little bit about whether there are paradoxes or perverse and unintended consequences here to the sanctions and the Russian and other responses. For example, are we driving legal economic activity underground? Are sanctions reducing transparency? Are they rearranging global trade patterns in a way that's disadvantageous for the rule of law and for Western countries? Are the sanctions having perverse and unintended effects and actually costing more than they're delivering in terms of pressure on Russia? So, so, so evaluate for us the, the, the skill, the expertise, the quality of the Russian government response, and then talk to us a little bit about the possibility of perverse and unintended consequences about the sanctions. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, the short answer again is all of the above, and you already answered all the questions that you asked. So, but now, now let me uh, let me add a little bit. Uh, the Russian government made lots of responses. Some of them were clever, and some of them were dumb. Some of them were foolish. And uh, Sergei mentioned uh, the currency controls that they imposed and they still enforce uh, correctly. Since the beginning of the war, it was clever. It was an anti-market measure, but nonetheless, it worked. Capital controls. Capital controls always work. And uh, we know from the uh, Asian financial crisis and others when there is a debt crisis and a currency crisis and uh, uh, the crisis of the financial system, capital controls help uh, to stem uh, capital flight and uh, support the banking system and support the exchange rate. So they imposed capital controls. But at the same time, uh, the most important, I would think, the most important policy, which is not often mentioned, but Sergei alluded to it, is bailouts. That's what they did on a massive scale, the same way we did during the Great Recession. I wouldn't blame them. Remember, Bernanke said, whatever it takes. And that's what they did, whatever it takes. If you look at the money supply, it increased month by month. Any month you pick up, doesn't matter, 25%. So you would expect an inflation explosion at some time, but it hasn't happened yet. But nonetheless, there will be a time, an inflection point, when inflation will explode. And then, of course, the real money supply will decline. And then it will have a, a, a terrible effect on GDP. It didn't happen yet. But nonetheless, those bailouts, huge running huge government expenditures, mostly one, one per person cleverly called it military Keynesianism. Uh, very good expression that they just spend the money and run the budget deficit on military expenditures, which increased by 30%. Uh, if you look at the first half of uh, 2023, 2022, and uh, they run budget deficit, they monetize it. 
they monetize it. Doesn't matter whether they sell uh, uh, money from the sovereign wealth fund or they print money, they still print money because they're uh, selling uh, the uh, sovereign wealth fund and uh, inject rubles into the economy. And so these bailouts, which are massive, uh, they kept the economy going and they kept GDP going. Now, they made huge blunders. And those blunders, they will pay for for a long time. Very few people mention them, if anyone. One blunder is out of spite, out of political considerations, maybe out of uh, just uh, not understanding economics. They said, we don't want dollars. We don't want euros. We will pay, we will trade in bilateral currencies. So uh, every there, and once they rerouted the oil trade and gas trade to China and India, they said, all right, we will uh, sell for rupees. We will sell for renminbi. And we will pay in the same currencies and we'll pay in rubles and we'll sell for rubles, what not. All right, this works if you run a trade balance. Then you can trade in seashells. It doesn't matter. But once you have a current account surplus, and you need to repay the debt in dollars, and what you receive is renminbi and rupees, you're in big trouble. So now of the current account surplus, by the way, uh, it's a nominal surplus because 38 billion dollars worth of rupees are sitting in Indian banks. No one knows what to do with them. They are not contributing to repaying the debt. And now there is a wonderful Russian joke which deserves to be mentioned. We, can, we cannot drink as much tea. Because what do you do with rupees? You buy tea, you cannot drink as much tea, and the surplus is just lost. So they're selling oil for free, effectively. Now, for, this is a big blunder. And out of spice, and when the Minister of Finance is talking about, quote-unquote, toxic currencies, if you think that dollars and euro are toxic currencies, this man should be fired. Because he is doing a lot of damage to the Russian economy. And if the psychology prevails, they have nothing to pay. The, the, second, the second big blunder. The second big blunder was they imposed the mandated discounts that they were afraid that the Russian oil sells too cheap and uh, because of the price caps. And therefore, they said, all right, if Brent is 85, we will, uh, we will make a mandated discount of $35 per uh, barrel. So $50 you sell, we don't care how much you get for it. We will charge $50 and we will tax $50. And then they reduced it from 35 to 31 and the next one 25. Now they're talking reducing to, 80, uh, to 20. The problem is that markets are smarter. Markets are smarter than them. And the actual discounts on the world market, the actual discounts were lower than what they expo imposed. And so for the, therefore, they gave the indulgence, they gave the permission to their companies to pay lower taxes. They undertaxed by their own mandate. And worst of all, they made it the, the law, not just the regulation. They made it the law of the land which is very hard to abolish. So months ago or so, they came to their sense and they said, all right, if the actual discount on the market from brand, so the oil will be more expensive, uh, will be lower than our mandated discount, we will charge the actual mar market price. And if they're higher, then we, will, uh, then we will just use this mandate. So they abolished too late. They lost maybe $50 billion uh, worth of taxes to their budget. So they made lots of blunders. At the same time, they were made some clever moves. And one was, again, uh, this, uh, uh, they're trying to save from the panic. They, first, they made a blunder. On the 14th of August, just a few days ago, they announced they didn't understand the symbolic uh, importance of the uh, rate of 100 rubles per dollar. And they, they announced on the website of the central bank and wherever that will be 101. And then there was a panic. So immediately they injected uh, $7 trillion, uh, excuse me, 7 trillion rubles of which 6.5 trillion, uh, 6.5 uh, was in dollars. 
uh, to prevent the bank, uh, the Ghanaian banks. That was clever, but they collected their own blunder. So all I'm saying is that the next effect might, might be that uh, uh, they did uh, more harm with their policies to the economy that they did good. So if this is crazy. They are relinquishing their ability to accumulate real currencies, tradable currencies, exchangeable currencies, like dollars and euros, and they're accumulating rupees or renminbi, or I noticed even dirham, the uh, currency of the UAE that Russia is accumulating in, in very significant numbers, uh, large quantities. And so we have this on the balance, right, on the books, that, but what can they do with these currencies that they hold? in the banks of the UAE or India, right? So that's that's one issue. But the other issue, we, we just clarify a little bit on the question of the self-imposed price caps, the self-imposed discounts on the oil that you're talking about and how they lost budget revenue. Why would anyone be so stupid as to forego budget revenue when already the budget is under pressure. Explain to us a little bit more, clarify if you would. What was the thinking there? Stephen, you have to be fair. Uh, this, you use the word stupid, I didn't want to use this term, I, I used to dumb. But nonetheless, it's not just the Russian government. If you look a few months ago at the Wall Street Journal, you will have a full page huge article with a picture of one young gentleman, I forgot his name, it said the man, the man who saved Russia. It was the deputy minister of energy or something, the fellow whom the president himself appointed. And this fellow introduced these mandates that uh, they, would, uh, they would have uh, specific numbers regardless of the market that they would uh, subtract from the brand price and charge. And of course, that was the man who ruined Russia. He didn't save Russia, but the Wall Street Journal was mistaken. So generally policy errors, unfortunately, we make policy errors, all governments make policy errors, and the Wall Street Journal uh, makes uh, miscalculation. So generally, uh, that, was, uh, that was a big blunder. But you, I didn't answer another question. You said the effect on the third countries. So generally now, yeah, but, but by the way, you mentioned Dirham. Dirham is very useful. They're buying real estate in Dubai. Russian oil companies uh, removed their big offices. Now several, several thousand trading, trading desks in Dubai. S Russian companies are selling Russian oil on the world market, evading both the sanctions and the mandates of the Russian budget, and they are taken away uh, from the Russian budget. So, uh, renminbi and rupees. Uh, uh, India, it's a huge boon for the Indian economic development because they open refineries. North African countries, Libya, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, they open refineries, they buy Russian crude, they refine, they sell on the world market. So there is a huge, huge, what we call externality, global externality, and it is great for economic development. The sanctions were great for economic development of developing countries. I see. Let me, let me, let me add to this. I, yeah. I think uh, some people would say Russia is losing this discount, Petra dollars, India is gaining because of the fact that uh, Mikhail mentioned that India is buying at a discount and then refines and sells at the market price to the same Europe that introduced embargo on Russian oil. That was intended. The oil price cap was exactly to uh, take money from Russia and give it to somebody else. Europe, for whatever reason, decided we don't touch Russian oil anymore. Well, almost nobody in Europe buys Russian oil and gas anymore. I guess this is because of reputational issues. You cannot really stand up uh, and say we support Ukraine and we pay about a billion dollars a day for Russian oil and gas, send it right to Putin. And so after you introduce the embargo, the question is who gets to benefit from uh, this oil price cap that we introduce? And somebody has to. And basically, it is not this externality is not something which India viciously uh, ill uh, gotten. This is really a part of the policy that was introduced. And this is an unprecedented policy. Oil price cap is something we've not seen before. And also, uh, I would like to add uh, 
to this discussion on uh, the minister who uh, deputy minister who either saved or ruined Russia, we should not forget that Russian government doesn't have complete information on how oil companies function. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, there is no single market for Russian oil. A lot of this oil is sold under the radar screen. There is no one uh, oil exchange for Russian oil. And so whenever we say the price for Russian oil is such, such, and such, this is in a sense speculation. And a lot of this stuff is going on in a very shadow market with shadow tankers. Sometimes the, uh, the uh, price reported is not the actual price because in addition to paying uh, $60 per barrel, which conforms with the oil price cap, you also have a side payment to, uh, to the oil company to compensate its uh, transportation costs and so on. So there, there, there is a lot of non-transparency going on there. So this is very complex uh, issue for Russian government. They brought it on themselves, but uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't forget how difficult it is to run an economy where everybody's cheating and, tell, and everybody's telling you we are cheating and hiding because we want to circumvent sanctions, but by circumventing sanctions, they also run away from Russian taxes. Right. Okay, I want to remind our uh, uh, viewers and listeners that this is the Hoover History Lab discussion of sanctions in Russia, effects, lessons, and the future. And now I'd like to turn uh, to the future, well, to, to, to understanding the vulnerabilities, the real and actual vulnerabilities of the Russian economy and potentially the Putin regime as a result of the war, the sanctions, the responses to the sanctions, the perverse and unintended consequences. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at uh, Mikhail's backdrop with, the, um, with, with a, a throwback to a different era, filing cabinets and a paper era. And I'm reminded that in 1997, when I was in Russia, 1990, part of 1998, I only obtained six rubles uh, for my dollar. And now I'm able to obtain approximately 100 rubles uh, to my dollar. So let's understand if that's a good thing or a bad thing for the Russian economy now and going forward, right? Uh, Russia is uh, well known for macroeconomic stability, macroeconomic expertise. Even under the Stalin regime, uh, budgets were under control, borrowing and debt payments were made on schedule by the Soviet Union until Mikhail Gorbachev's era when he blew open, uh, undermined the macroeconomic st uh, stability. So Russia has a long history of a highly qualified finance ministry, a highly qualified central bank, and leaders who recognize the importance, the value to their own governments, their authoritarian regimes of a certain macroeconomic stability. Uh, are we? Now in a different place, has Russia ruined its macroeconomic stability? Is the Russian economy vulnerable? Uh, inflation at 7% approximately, the hemorrhaging of human capital, of, of, of financial capital, and, and the labor shortages, the budget deficits, the debt repayment scheduling. How do we understand how critical all of this is for the Russian regime. And in fact, can we understand it? Is it available for us to figure this out? Sergei just mentioned the difficulties of understanding uh, what's happening and of controlling what's happening. So let's walk through a little bit the picture of the extent to which the vulnerabilities are regime threatening or war effort threatening and the extent to which the vulnerabilities are bad, but can be managed. Mikhail, let's start with you. Uh, just look at the numbers. In 2022, the current account surplus was $233 billion. Out of that, they were able, without re any refinancing, to repay $101 billion of exter external debt. They did very well. The same thing happened in, uh, during the um, sanctions of 2014-2015. They had to repay over $200 billion in debt, uh, and they did. But at that time, they had to deplete their foreign exchange reserves of the central bank to bail out their private 
debtors, corporations, and banks, and that uh, the contraction of the money supply led to the contraction of the real GDP, uh, 2%, and that was uh, the result. Now, they did it out of the current account surplus because uh, uh, their foreign exchange reserves, more than half of them are frozen. 2023 is a totally different picture. We have only 25 uh, billion dollars in uh, current, the current account surplus, part of which is in rupees. So we don't know actually what the real current account surplus is. And they have, they publish the schedule, they have forthcoming 120 billion dollars of repaying the debt, includes short term debt, which means a few months, and the maturing long term debt, which has to be repaid in the next 12 months. How they are going to do it? I don't see this arithmetically possible. The next thing is their budget deficit. That if you extrapolate from what we have for the first half and the first seven months, it will be something like uh, uh, 4.8 to 5 trillion rubles in 2023, which is 3% of GDP. And I'm being very conservative because lots of people would give you more scary numbers. It will be 3% of GDP, which they are going to finance for the sovereign wealth fund. You look at the sovereign wealth fund, $155 billion, nice. So they can go ahead. No, they can't. Because the liquid part, there is a big dirty secret of the Russian economy. The liquid part of the sovereign wealth fund is $79 billion dollars. What is the rest? I am sorry, Stephen. The junk bonds of the Russian companies. Russian railroad company. The sovereign wealth fund, what they call the sovereign wealth fund in Russia, is not what the Saudis or the Norway or others would call the sovereign wealth fund. Because it is not just United States treasuries, which they already sold, and not Great Britain pound denominated assets, and not even renminbi assets, which are very good and solid. Some of them are in rubles, denominated in euro bonds, denominated in dollars, but nonetheless, those are the shares of state-owned Russian companies. Half of the sovereign wealth fund is what Russia owns to itself, and it can print money. So generally, uh, I would say that if there are no uh, loans from China and from the Emirates, then they would have a situation in which they have maybe 1.5 years that they can finance their budget deficit, and after that, there is an internal default. And the, the numbers speak for, speak for themselves. That's, that's what it is. You mentioned the technical default, Michal, in the decree that uh, the president of Russia issued uh, a few days ago here in August 2023. Explain a little bit uh, whether the technical default could become an actual default in a shorter period of time, because you're giving them a long period of time here, about a year and a half, to manage this macroeconomic catastrophe that's potentially looming. But you, but in, in mentioning the technical default earlier this very month, I want to know how that relates to the longer time frame that you just mentioned now. Last June 2022, uh, the world press was full of the uh, articles about that Russia had a technical default when uh, Janet Yellen, the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, did not extend the waiver for paying. So the Russians had the money to pay. They were willing to pay. They wanted to pay. And we didn't let them, and there were a few million dollars here and there, and we talked about technical defaults, and suddenly everyone forgot about it. This is serious now, because we're talking not about millions, we're talking about billions. Some of them is sovereign debt, some of them is corporate debt, and the most dangerous is the debt of the banking system, because if a corporation, even a major state-owned corporation, goes into bankruptcy, so what? Uh, but if uh, bank failures, uh, like the domino effect, but people run on banks, that's serious. It's a collapse of the banking system. So this is what is going on. And uh, the decree of uh, the Russian president of August the 9th uh, effectively lifted the state guarantees 
of the debt of the private companies. So it is a road to a technical default. It's not announced. All payments are still made. There is a great deal of ambiguity there because the six package of the EU, EU sanctions in June 2022 was very ambiguous. It was an Annex 1 where there was some strange language. They said, yeah, the Russians cannot use the European financial system to repay their debt, but they can. The Euro clear finally had to, yeah, the Russians went to the courts. It goes to the Luxembourg court. It's still pending. And in December 2022, the Euro clear announced that they made an informal announcement to the Russian uh, state depository fund that they can repay debt in dollars and euros. So it is legal, it is illegal, it is legal, it is ambiguous. So the Russians are repaying, they can do it, but they're running out of money. So when the technical default will turn into the real default, well, first when there will be a technical default, and then when there will be a real default, when they run out of money. Okay, so Gay, same same question back to you, right? We have uh, our viewers and listeners have been expecting some form of Russian collapse, possibly on the battlefield, a disintegration of the Russian army in the field, maybe in the capital, in the political sense, a kind of political bank run. We had the uh, the march on Moscow by the Wagner Group. Uh, which was halted, but nonetheless gave people the impression that there's a possibility of political change in the capital. So we've been watching for battlefield disintegration, political disintegration in the capital. Neither one has happened yet. Maybe they're not going to happen at all. But here we're talking about the possibility of the economy be and the macroeconomic situation being as great or even a greater vulnerability than possibly the battlefield or the political situation. Now, of course, an economic disintegration could have tremendous effects on the battlefield and on the political system in the capital, right? So in other words, these are all connected, not artificially separated, but I think we've spent less time understanding the possibility of an economic unraveling compared to a battlefield or a political unraveling, because in part, Russia has seemed to manage the sanctions. The sanctions are uh, uh, almost a year and a half old, and Russia's economy is still there. There's been a contraction, there's been inflation, there's been all the things we discussed. And yet at the same time, they're managing. They have third party intermediaries and cutouts in, uh, helping them evade sanctions. They're still getting massive supplies of semiconductors, even though they're not showing up in the official bilateral trade statistics, they're going through the Dubai port and other places reaching Russia. And, and so has Russia managed the crisis and will somehow muddle through economically? Uh, with the sanctions, even if the sanctions are improved here and there in the, your whack-a-mole metaphor? Or is this really the ultimate vulnerability and that it's only a matter of time and we just have to be patient and or apply a little bit more pressure here and there and we can unravel this economically and th affect the battlefield and the war settlement that way? Thank you, Stephen. I think uh, the fact that you mentioned that all these issues are connected is extremely important. So for example, uh, economic pressures limit Russia's ability to produce more weapons and to buy more weapons in Iran and North Korea because of simple uh, issue of budgetary constraints. So this is one of the reasons why Mr. Prigozhin and the Wagner Group had this mutiny, had this march in Moscow. Mr. Prigozhin has complained that he's not getting enough munitions. He actually said, I'm not getting enough munitions to advance. And this is one of the reasons why Russian army has not won this war so far, because sanctions do work. Just imagine what would have happened if these sanctions have not been introduced. Think about Russia still buying without any limits, uh, without any financial constraints, 
buying all kinds of military technology, including semiconductors, what would be the military outcome in the battlefield? In that sense, sanctions have already made sure that Russia has not won this war. In this uh, scarcity of munitions, we've seen that already uh, in the beginning of 2023, Mr. Prigodin, the head of Wagner, recorded many public messages complaining about the lack of munitions. And eventually, this is what, what resulted in his mutiny. Now, uh, I fully agree, uh, Russia is now managing this, um, this uh, game uh, well above expectations, but uh, there are cracks. One of those, of those cracks I would mention is during this mutiny, we saw zero people who stood up for Mr. Putin. Mr. Putin reports that 80% of Russians support him or 90% of Russians support him. We saw no manifestations or protests against Mr. Prigozhin. Nobody went out to defend Putin. No single governor or general recorded a message of support for Mr. Putin against Mr. Prigozhin, right? So uh, that also sends you a message that if Mr. Putin wants to uh, manage the budget deficit by decreasing spending, say, on pensioners or doctors, that may result in additional political tensions. And there, Mr. Putin will use Wagner or riot police to, to, um, uh, to suppress those potential protests. Will that work? How much the passion, uh, patience sorry, of, uh, of Russian pensioners is? We don't know. And this is one of those challenges. So we don't know to what extent Michael's estimate of 1.5 five years is too optimistic or too pessimistic. There are too many unknowns, as we mentioned. And uh, one of those unknowns, and I fully agree with Michael, we don't know. Uh, we don't know um, how much of the remaining liquid part of Russian sovereign wealth fund is in yuans or rupees. We mentioned rupees, probably we talk about $40 billion uh, worth of rupees. Uh, that's a lot of money, and rupees are much worse than yuan. And so we don't know those things. We don't know how uh, well Russia will be able to manage this uh, budget deficit issue. What I'm very confident of is that Russian central bank is uh, able to manage the inflation issue. And so the reason ruble is now uh, weaker is because Russia has moved to this uh, flexible exchange rate, floating exchange rate, inflation target and macroeconomic paradigm. And this framework is a, uh, is a, a textbook, mainstream economics uh, uh, textbook uh, framework. And so Russian central bank is pretty competent. It will make ruble weaker if there are challenges uh, uh, that Mikhail described, if these challenges are continuing. At the same time, it will try to raise interest rates to fight inflation. So this is something that I'm not worried about. If I were a Russian uh, prime minister or president, I would really worry about the budget deficit that Mikhail has described. And uh, that may result in defaults, that's true. But we shouldn't forget that the main cost of default is that you cannot borrow anymore. But Russia cannot borrow anymore at all already because of the sanctions. And so these are, these are the challenges. And uh, I, I generally agree with this idea of one and a half or two years worth of uh, space, fiscal space for Russian government. But there are so many uncertainties on each side of that that it's very hard to say, we should just be patient because this patient may be four years or five years, which is probably too costly for us. It may be half a year. Nobody expected Prigozhin's mutiny a week before, right? So, so all of this, all of these things are very uncharted waters. And it's very hard to say. I would strongly recommend not to be too patient and really re uh, ramp up sanctions, play the whack a mole game, enforce the existing sanctions, and all tighten up the uh, the oil price scam. And remember that. For each loophole closed, Russian government will try to find another loophole, but each additional loophole is costlier, thus aggravating the fiscal deficit situation. Okay, Mikhail, we're going to turn to you for the last word here, right? So, so Sergei's argument that, you know, in addition to the Ukrainian courage on the battlefield and the Ukrainian ingenuity and the Western support in weapons and finance, that the sanctions have had an effect on Russia's uh, battlefield performance, right? So uh, obviously the sanctions alone uh, are not the reason that Russia uh, hasn't achieved its war aims. The Ukrainians are the main reason that that's the case. But Sergei's argument is that the sanctions definitely have had an effect on Russia's capabilities. And so will that effect increase 
Uh, could we increase that effect, that pressure that Sergei is, is asking us to increase? Are there uh, things that Russia itself, mistakes it might make? You mentioned all the blunders, right? One of the beauties of an authoritarian regime is that it's often not competent in, in many areas and often makes mistakes, especially when uh, no one is, is uh, incentivized to bring negative information to the bosses, for example, and they hear only positive information. So close us out here on how you see Russia's ability to keep going and whether there could be a surprise or two and where that surprise might come from. Uh, let me pick up the military metaphor, military analogy that you used. And I would say that if you, uh, if you look at it in perspective, uh, the, the sanctions started as a blitzkrieg. The, the few weeks, maybe a few days, it was a blitzkrieg and uh, they got out of it. And now we have a year and a half of the trench warfare. And it's a draw. No one lost, no one won. But uh, so what's to look uh, into ahead? I would say that we are, we've started maybe in August this year with the exchange rates, with the budget deficit, with the debt repayment, uh, we started the decisive battle. It's a long battle. This battle will be fought on the debt front, on the fiscal front, on the monetary front, on the banking front. It will last. It's a long battle. It will last four months. We have to watch it. But I think the important thing I want to say I think it's a decisive battle. It's a final battle. And I cannot foresee how Russia can win it. Final question we have is the long-term trajectory for Russia. Uh, a great country, a giant civilization, uh, worthy of better, poorly led, criminal aggression against Ukraine, diminishing its strategic capacity in every way. Uh, how do we see the long-term for Russia here? Uh, is the trajectory they're on sustainable? Can they succeed as a country going forward while still hemorrhaging human capital and everything else they're doing? Sergey, what do you think? Well, I think uh, the human capital loss is the most important challenge to the long-term uh, trajectory of Russia. Today, in a modern economy, this is what matters. Human capital is what creates the future, is what drives economic growth. And Russia has lost probably a million of citizens. Um, and uh, also, these are the citizens, these are the professionals who also contribute to the Russian educational system that reproduces new human capital. And in that sense, we can compare what's happened to Russia to what happened 100 years ago after 1917 October uh, Revolution, when again, from one to three million best educated people have left. So uh, this is a challenge Russia should be able to recover uh, after Putin is gone. But even then, this will be a challenge because a lot of people who've left will not come back. Also, Russia broke, uh, uh, did break the links with its main trading partner, European Union and the West in general. It is the West, which is the source of advanced technology. So even if Putin is gone today, this war has already damaged the long-term economic trajectory substantially. It's very hard to measure by how much, but uh, this war, of course, has uh, caused a lot of pain and tragedy in Ukraine, but it's also undermined uh, Russia's future as well. Mikhail? Uh, Long-term costs are probably greater than the short-term costs. Uh, this is, in effect, de-westernization, de-globalization of Russia, uh, changing, changing its market's directions. Uh, the loss of uh, foreign investment, the loss of foreign uh, capital, the loss of technological advancement, which comes from the West, will have very long-term consequences. Uh, 25 years ago, there was a default, after which one lady British investor said, we will rather eat nuclear waste than go back to Russia. Well, took a few years back and uh, took a few years and uh, all Western uh, technologies and Western investors were back to Russia. I do not see this happening again. And so Russia, I would think, sort of cut off itself with the ex exodus of human capital because not only people are living today, but the next generation knows that 
if they look ahead, they will do better, they will be better off going to the West instead of staying. This is a new attitude and it will change uh, the trajectory of uh, Russian economic growth and development. Okay, thank you so much to the two of you, Sergei Guriev, Mikhail Bernstam, for our discussion today of Russia and sanctions. Um, we hope that both of you are correct and, and we hope that the Russian people uh, can uh, at some point understand what it is that you both understand really well as uh, living outside of Russia, having been born there. Okay, thank you and be well. <laughs>